Seas National, one of the co-hosts of the show. We are in Edmonton, Alberta tonight, where we are going to start in about five or ten minutes' time a live conversation here um, at the Nate Technology Center in Edmonton. But the conversation is also with you at home. If you're watching this on Facebook, YouTube, or cbc.ca, we want you to help us uh, direct this conversation about the future of Alberta, what's happening uh, in the energy sector, the future of pipelines, the oil and gas industry, concerns you might have about employment, all those things we want to hear from you. So if you've got a question, just go down to the comments section and uh, stick it in there. We've also got a live audience here tonight. They too will get a chance to ask questions. We have uh, lots of special guests here to help guide us through this conversation too. The Premier, Rachel Notley, will be here. She, of course, uh, you know, heading into an election in a number of months, so she is really the person accountable for some of the things that have happened in the province lately. Your questions will go to her as well. And we have a panel of experts who I will introduce to the uh, live audience shortly as well. Let me bring you over here if we can. Chris Lubicki, he's the CEO of Modern Resources. Jackie Forrest, Senior Director at ARC. Hunter Cardinal, he works in strategic communications in indigenous communities. And Sachi Curl from Angus Reid, who's gone MIA, but we'll find her. Uh, she's been doing a lot of polling as of late about people's impressions of Western Canada uh, and these energy issues. Okay, we've got a first question already, so let's just start getting the, the panel warmed up, if you will. Marlo asks via Twitter, knowing that both old and new energy tech will be needed going forward, how is Alberta moving forward or incentivizing existing producers with clean tech or sustainable technologies? Uh, Chris, you want to take a stab at that? So I know we're, we're talking about oil and gas, but obviously people are also looking to, you know, what happens down the line uh, and, and how those new technologies might help the oil and gas sector, but also how they move us to a greener economy. I'd say two things from Modern Resources perspective, my company. Uh, one, we're six years old. When we started, we made a very conscious effort. We're going to do this better. We're going to do it the new way. Mm. So we've developed technology we call mule technology, modern ultra low emission technology. So our natural gas sites are completely uh, methane emission free and virtually CO2 emission free. Mm. I, I can't say zero, but virtually. Uh, so we're well uh, ahead of any regulations, and we're sharing this technology with a, a, any other company because this isn't uh, an oil and gas concern, this is an international concern. Uh, the other thing I would say is the oil and gas industry is very much an adopter of renewable technology yep. because the vast majority of our sites are off the grid. We can't plug in, there's no plugs, there's no power close by. So you have so, to find ways to do So it. we find yeah. it, so we use uh, solar, we use uh, methanol powered fuel cells, we use uh, all sorts of renewable power. Uh, I would say we're the early adopters of it because we need it. Yeah, Jackie, you too, you, I mean, you study a lot of these issues at, at ARC, at the Institute there. What, what kinds of innovative things or how important is that to the future of Alberta and the economy here? I think it's really important and we're real leaders right now in terms of the methane reduction policy. So Alberta government is rolling out very stringent policies to reduce methane. Methane is a very important greenhouse gas. It's yep. actually more potent than CO2. And the technologies that are being developed right now that Chris talked about are I think going to be deployed not only here in Alberta but around the world because every oil and gas region has this issue. This is really the low hanging fruit in terms of dealing with climate change. And I think we're positioning ourselves as leaders and our companies are going are to be able to benefit from that. Okay, I'm going to uh, we found Shachi, so just say hi to her because she was just signing back there. <laughs> I was working quietly, <laughs> doing my thing. It's not the official show, sure, okay. I just want to show people that are watching us uh, on our streaming uh, platforms, if you will, where those mm. questions are going to end up. Don't die, don't die here, you guys, because they're working backwards. This is our uh, digital team over here. Uh, some people from Edmonton, some people from Toronto, and they will be monitoring your questions and then feeding them in to us so that we can get your best questions to the premier, to our experts. And then if you go, you guys want to turn that way? You can see the real people. These are the actual audience members that have come up in very, very cold temperatures in Edmonton to uh, be at this event tonight. So we're excited to see everybody there and take questions from them as well. Okay, we'll go back in here to see what time we're starting. Are we starting yet? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, Sachi, can I'll ask you a question while you're here. <laughs> You've been doing a lot of uh, uh, looking at what is happening sort of in terms of sentiments in Western Canada and the, the rest. Things. All the things. All the things. How would you say uh, Albertans feel from what you've seen and polled about 
whether they are being heard, understood, that kind of stuff. They're not feeling that at all. So you have Alberta very much as an outlier in this country in terms of its level of frustration, in terms of that level of resentment of its voice not being heard, like they're so angry we're dropping pens. Uh, but just as much sentiment is so hardened in Alberta, whether it's on the importance of the oil and gas sector relative to the rest of the country, or relative to the way uh, Albertans feel in terms of are they being treated fairly yep. by the federal government and the rest of the country, there's just so much feels mm. that Albertans are feeling and they're not particularly good feelings at mm. the moment and and they're they are crying out to be heard yes well, well that's sort of why we're here right to make sure that we start to understand and and listen and do a better job maybe at getting some answers um, Hunter what, what do you see I mean you work with lots of indigenous communities yeah. uh, you know without generalizing how are people feeling about sort of how uh, Alberta is doing inside those communities right now? But I actually would say it um, echoes the sentiments that most Albertans are feeling. But what I think is intriguing about that question is we have an opportunity as treaty people to dive into not only what does that mean, um, but to reinvigorate a very old agreement between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people to move forward in a way where we can share in abundance the resources of the land. So for me, I think it's an exciting opportunity to look to the future and say, how do we want to move forward together? Okay, well, let's let's get this all started. So if you are uh, watching this, streaming it, remember you can put your comments underneath and ask us any questions. We'll try to get to as many as we can here and in the room. The national conversation starts now. This is my home. This is my town. Many of these people have planned for the boom and bus cycles. It's just going on too long this time. Every month there'll be another bankruptcy. There's another person close their doors. They're saying that their savings are depleted. They're starting to use credit and that's starting to run out as well. Lots of people left, the big money left. As much as I, I hate to say it, it, I don't think we've seen the worst of it. We need to move this along. This is our livelihood. We got to get our message to somebody that can listen to us. They don't understand what we're up against. Canada's got to get together rather than work apart. Therefore, my question is, I would like to know, what do you plan to do? How are you going to? Is the government aware? What is your government doing to make the next generation successful? Do you think it's possible that this situation can be corrected? Everybody and welcome to the National Conversation in Alberta. We're thrilled to be here and uh, thrilled to have all of you live and in person who braved the very cold temperatures of Edmonton. Uh, even as a Winnipegger, I'm uh, quite alarmed that you're all still alive in this cold <laughs> weather. Thank you all for being here. If you're watching this on our streaming platforms, Facebook, YouTube, uh, cbc.ca, you also can participate. Put uh, your questions in the comments section just underneath. Of course, the Premier, Rachel Notley, also here tonight. Uh, and we'll try and get to as many questions as we can from her. But let me introduce our panel, first of all, some people who know a lot about uh, the issue, how people are feeling about the issue. Chris Lubicki is CEO of Modern Resources. It's an oil and gas company, small one, but it's a very good one, apparently, he tells me. Jackie Forrest is Senior Director of Arc Energy Institute. Hunter Cardinal works in strategic communications with lots of indigenous communities um, in the region. And Shachi Curl, who many of you may know from uh, At Issue, my favorite night of the week, Shachi is with Angus Reid and has been putting out a lot of numbers in the past couple weeks about Alberta and Western Canada. So lots of questions for them. This is really about uh, taking questions from you. Let's direct the conversation however you guys want to do it uh, here and online. I'm going to start with an online question. If you in the audience have a question, put up your hand and one of our people will get to you. The first question comes from Aaron Harpel, who asks on Facebook, Alberta's had Canada's fastest growing economy for the last couple years, but oil and gas workers are still hurting. What can be done to strengthen and diversify the energy sector, which I think is something everyone's sort of seized with, and certainly we can ask the Premier about it as well, whether the whole economy at large needs to be more diversified or whether something particular should be done in the energy sector. Do you want to start with that one, Jackie? Sure. I mean, definitely it's challenging times right now. Um, we're expecting investment in Western Canada to be 
around 20 to 30 percent lower than last year, and that's filtering through now. You're starting to see a loss of jobs, especially in the rural areas where a lot of the drilling activity was going on. Um, and we're well, well off what we were in 2014. Today, we're about half the activity level that we were back then. And we have to recognize that you know, we're, we need pipelines, for sure we do, but not all those jobs are going to come back um, if we get a pipeline. And so they're, you know, the, the industry has changed, uh, fundamentally changed. You know, the technologies we have developed means that we can produce more oil and gas with less people. And so I think we have to look about um, how to diversify the economy to find jobs for everybody in the economy. And the good news is I think there is lots of opportunity there. We're actually seeing that in Calgary where we're starting to see innovation centers, more digital and oil and gas type solutions. Well, and that's, I probably like the economy everywhere as things get, you know, because of automation, artificial intelligence, jobs start to evolve and change and disappear. Chris, how, how many employees do you have at your company? 24 employees. Okay. And have you had to think about cutting back? Is that something that's happened to you? Or when you see the, the big guys playing and having to lay off tens of thousands, what, what goes through your mind? Uh, we haven't laid off any employees at Modern. However, uh, two years ago, 2017, we would have spent $120 million investing in the Canadian economy. Last year, we slowed down uh, to about 95 million. This year, in the first half, we'll spend 10 million. So in terms of employment in the field, and these are drilling rigs, completion, construction, facilities. Two years ago, we probably would have employed 350 contractors. Today, I'd say we employ about 20. Wow. Yeah, that's pretty stark when you hear the numbers like that. We have a question in the audience. So see, we are going to get to your questions. <laughs> Where are we going first? O over to Randy. Hello, just give us your name and uh, go ahead. Thank you. Um, my name's Christy and I am a bit concerned that I'm not hearing about the IPCC report that came out in the fall. In you know, every panel on CBC, every answer should be couched in this fact that our scientists, that the evidence shows that we have 10 years to get on a different path here. And don't get me wrong, I'm very thankful for natural gas right now. I mean, it's, it's really cold out there. But I think about those poor people in 100 years when natural gas is gone and we haven't planned for them and what they're going to do. So I think my question is, um, why aren't the politicians, politicians taking the evidence seriously and acting on that evidence? Thank you. So, I mean, we don't have politicians up here yet, but we'll hold on to that question. There is a carbon tax in Alberta, as you know, uh, and a federal carbon tax being imposed in other places. Shachi, maybe, uh, maybe that's a good question for you. When we're talking about these issues, how concerned are Canadians, Albertans, about uh, the, these dire warnings from the IPCC, sure, but also from the United Nations and others? Well, this is the collision course, because on one hand, across the country and in Alberta, Albertans, Canadians are saying climate change is very serious. They are very concerned. It's a crisis. Yeah. They're also saying the lack of new oil pipeline capacity in this country is a crisis. And nowhere uh, else but in Alberta is that view near unanimous, like 90% of people in this province feel that way. Yeah. So, Jackie, to your point, you know, when we talk about the, the change of work and how work has to innovate and jobs and industries will ebb and new ones will flow, uh, the sense I get in terms of the sentiment that's being felt in this province is that I, I think about an anecdote growing up when the cod fishery fell apart in Newfoundland and Labrador, and there was so much national empathy for what yeah. people in those communities were going through. And I think the sense that Albertans are feeling is that that empathy is not there in terms of the natural resource sector. So I think, you know, the, these are two tough things. Uh, that need to be reconciled. The premier in this province was among some politicians who have tried to reconcile them both, but that fact that we haven't seen new capacity come online yet has really intensified feelings on one side. Yeah, and it makes it yeah. harder. I think the, the prime minister would agree it makes it harder to push forward with green initiatives when you don't have more pipelines being built, at least. That's what he's saying. I have an audience question, but Jackie, you go yeah, first. Yeah, I just want to quickly yeah. say I've read the IPC report, and 
you know, climate change is a real issue. It's a serious issue, and I, I agree. A lot of Albertans see that, but I, I don't think it's an either and or. It seems like the conversation is around if we're going to meet climate change, then we can't have an oil and gas industry, and that just isn't the case. If you look at projections for oil and gas demand, even in scenarios that meet very aggressive carbon goals, we still have oil and gas for decades to come, and I think there's a role for Canada to play here to deliver low carbon oil and gas as we make that transition. And if you look at that LNG facility we're building on the West Coast, that's going to be the lowest carbon LNG in the world. Um, and so that's the opportunity. We can lead um, by bringing our technologies to Canada and to the world. Okay, another audience question over there with Adrian. Go ahead. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Rajiv. I work at uh, Nate Polytechnic. Uh, the question I have is for the, if you can answer, I don't know, for the Alberta government is, uh, what are the plans for uh, the government strategically to diversify in other industries other than oil and gas? I feel like you guys all want the premier here right now. <laughs> I know she's listening, so maybe she's taking some notes. Uh, I mean, that was sort of the first question about, around diversification, and I think a recognition that um, there have to be other ways to, for the economy to be moving, but also other ways to balance the environment and exploration. Um, do you want to weigh in on that, Hunter? What do, you, what do you hear from people about how difficult it is to balance those two issues, energy yeah. development and the environment? Well, you know, I think that what we're seeing is that there are a plethora of different opinions and perspectives about what is to be done around this issue. And I think that it can be very tempting to try to boil it down into it's either this or it's not this. Um, my perspective is we need to have a conversation that takes into account those complexities that allows us to create that understanding so that we can move forward in a way that is rational, understanding what is truly going on and then creating a better future together. Okay, I wanna first of all, I forgot to do this off the top, acknowledge the mayor of Drayton Valley who's in the audience. I don't know if you wanna just raise your hand. There he is. And the mayor of uh, Sturgeon County also came in. The mayor of Sturgeon County. Hello, nice to see you. And we're, they both have some questions, I think, that they would like to get to the Premier, so we'll try and get to them as well. But first, we do have a, we got a couple curated questions uh, by video, so we'll go to one of those now. Hello, I'm Gary Nelson. Some hours otherwise. Why can't we get the pipeline? Like a pipeline in the ground after the grass starts growing, you'll never see it. It's the cleanest way of moving oil. If somebody's worried about the environment, put it through a pipeline. Canada's got to get together rather than work apart. Like, I mean, why would we buy oil from Saudi Arabia when we've got tons over here? My question is, in Alberta, we're harvesting oil from the very high standards. Just wondering why we're buying oil and shipping it across the ocean from countries that don't harvest that oil at that standards we have. That, so that's a question I hear a lot, uh, and maybe it's a question that's come up in, in your minds too. Um, Jackie, do you want to take a stab at that one? The fact yeah. that Canada, uh, a net exporter of crude, uh, selling lots to the United States, more oil than we know what to do with, mm -hmm. and yet Eastern Canada, uh, barrels of oil are still coming in from elsewhere. Yeah, we consume about 2.4 million barrels a day of crude, and about 0.8 of that is being imported. And the reason for it is actually historical and all economic. You know, it, we're a long ways away from Eastern Canada. It, to build a pipeline and move that oil across the country uh, was more expensive than to get oil delivered from overseas. And so that has been the way it's always been because the economics have said, you know, that that's the way to do it. Of course, we're not as secure in terms of our energy security. Um, and uh, today, uh, we have an abundance of oil and there's an opportunity, I think, to get more oil to Eastern Canada. But we don't have a pipeline. We don't have a pipeline. I mean, it comes down to sort of the regional base for where oil moves and how it gets refined. Mm -hmm. I did look it up, though, because I, I hear it a lot. So I'll, I'll go to Chris and then Sachi, but I hear a lot about how much we import from Saudi Arabia. So I did just make sure we had that statistic on, on tap. Natural Resources Canada says it's about 12% right now. Of, of the total that we export, the most comes from the United States. Chris and then Sachi, and then I'm going to go into the audience. Sure, I, I appreciate the woman's comment about uh, climate change, which is a, a key, key issue. And the whole debate, as Hunter mentioned, has been very polarized. It's either this or that. But I think when we talk about energy, all forms of energy, but certainly oil and gas as well, we have to look broader. 
and in terms of where we source our energy. And climate uh, change is important mm -hmm. and, and environmental standards, but there's other elements as well that should be considered. And uh, when you look at other elements, worker safety, human rights, gender equality, religious freedom, indigenous consultation, yeah. uh, Clim environmental regulations, there is no country in the world that holds a candle to Canada. We're the best in the world at it. So uh, we should be developing our own resource. I can't answer the gentleman's question of why we're importing from other places. Well, I think it's the lack of ways to get it there. Well, definitely, no, but I why mean, are we building But it? why yeah, are we yeah, doing yeah, that? Yeah. yeah, okay, Shachi, and then I'll head out here. It also speaks to political will, and it speaks to the fact that in this country we are not monolithic at all in terms of our views, it, it, these are very micro-regional views. Yeah. So part of the reason we don't have Energy East is because Quebecers are firmly not in favor, firmly opposed to Energy East, uh, and, and they are an outlier on that front. Uh, about half the country actually says we support TMX, but we also would, we'd be okay with an Energy East pipeline. So when you have regions, British Columbians are very divided on the issue of the pipeline that will go through their province, about 50% say, yeah, it's okay, the other half say no. Um, Quebecers are all together, not on side with any pipelines. And when you have the issue of who should have sort of that, that no, that veto, when sh and how should that voice carry more weight? Certainly, if you are at ground zero where a pipeline terminus point would be, uh, you're much more likely to be opposed to it. And those voices, I think, particularly in Quebec, have carried a lot of weight. Um, and they're fighting pretty hard in British Columbia. And as a result, we see questions like this from, you know, about six in ten uh, Canadians across the country, whether they're in Ontario or Manitoba or Atlantic Canada or in Alberta or Saskatchewan, saying, why can't we get this done? In part because we have such disparate regional views yeah. on these issues. And God help a, a national politician who's trying to thread the needle on this. Yeah, and I, I, and I think you're right when it comes to, oh, this is going to be in my backyard. Well, in that case, I'm not so sure. Okay, the gentleman out here. Hello. Hi, my name is Kareem. Uh, you've created a crisis of confidence here in Alberta, which has absolutely damaged our economy. You continue to take $24 billion a year out of our province, and then you spend it in your other provinces. And you make off like you don't use gas and oil on a daily basis. Here in Alberta, we help to supply the rest of the country with money, and yet the rest of Canada and our Prime Minister, who's been a disaster for us, has created an unbelievable crisis of confidence in our economy. We should be swimming in money here in Alberta, and we're not because of what's been going on over the last few years. Okay, thank you. And again, I think that's a sentiment lots of people share. There you go. Um, why don't you, do you want to just start with that? Because that, that's very much some of the numbers that you've been looking at. Um. Absolutely. Albertans are feeling really isolated relative to the rest of the country. Uh, I mean, let's face it, you feel like the rest of the country doesn't get you right now. And particularly central Canada, particularly parts of Ontario and Quebec. And nowhere else, no other province is seen, I just want to tell you, um, by the rest of the country to be uh, giving more than it gets from Confederation. Now, that's only about a third of the country that feels that way, but there is no other province that comes close to Alberta in terms of that sentiment in the sense that, you know what, you may be getting a raw deal these days. At the same time, I would say that people coast to coast are more engaged on this file than they have been in years. Uh, I think a lot of Canadians, particularly east of Manitoba, regarded the pipeline file as an Alberta issue, or at most an Alberta BC issue. I think now we're starting to see the needle move uh, and see it as a Canadian issue. Why? Two reasons, quickly. One, we all bought a pipeline. Right? They talk about government buying a pipeline. You bought a pipeline, and you bought a pipeline, and you bought a pipeline. We all own a pipeline. So there is a part of that everyone feels a little more a matter of stake in the issue. The, the second factor is the, is the all-out PR uh, uh, campaign that the government of Alberta, and it doesn't matter if it's an NDP government or a UCP government, you know, this is a, a provincial government that's, that's advocating in its province's interests, uh, running ads coast to coast, talking about the importance of pipelines, and we have started to see the needle 
tick in a different direction as a result. Not as quickly and not as much as a lot of you in this yeah. room, in this province would like, but it's starting to move a little. Yeah, I mean, there is just a downtown Ottawa, uh, sort of not far from Parliament Hill, a projection that the government of Alberta has has paid for, talking about how much money is lost every day that the pipeline is not expanded. So if you don't think it's on people's <laughs> minds, the gov your government is making sure yeah. that we think about it a little bit more. Yeah, Chris. I'd like to add to it as well, because this is really, I think, the seminal question here in Alberta, and thank you for asking it. Uh, we have an economic crisis here in Alberta, and people are frustrated and they're angry. And I think it showed in your voice. Sure. For the first time in 40 years, there's serious talk of separation in Alberta, and, and that's not a good thing. No. People are frustrated and angry because we can't build the infrastructure, the pipelines, and this is both oil and natural gas, to get a world price, a fair price for our natural resources for the benefit of all Canadians. This is not simply an Alberta matter. What we need is a strong, clear, reliable, workable regulatory system to allow for the building of uh, environmentally responsible infrastructure. And the good news is, we can do that. Th this crisis we face, it's entirely made in Canada by Canadians. We can solve this. But what it's going to take is a clear and unequivocal strong commitment from our federal government for the natural resources industry. So they, they would say to you that Bill C-69, which I know you all know probably too much about, the, the bill that is now being looked at by the Senate to overhaul the National Energy Board, create one regulator, and try, the, the federal government would suggest, to keep the timelines tighter uh, and do things better. They would say that that is their response to what you're talking about. Uh, I, would, I would equate it to getting your degree. When you're going to send your child to get their engineering degree, I'll use that, I'm an engineer, you want to know three things. What do I have to do to get there? How long is it going to take me? Uh, and how much is this going to cost? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if you're a child, you have to take these courses, it's going to take you four years, it's going to cost you $100,000 or whatever it costs. Under Bill C-69, we don't know the answer to any of those questions. What do we have to do? How long is it going to take? and what's it going to cost. There is no company that will undertake an energy project under Bill C-69 in its current form. But they're not doing it now either. Well, but they're not doing it now either. And that's why we own a pipeline. There, that's very true. The problem we have is, <laughs> the problem that we have here in Alberta is 10 years in the making. This didn't happen yesterday yeah. or last week. Yeah. It's going to take a couple of years to, to correct it. Having said that, the current process that we have through the uh, National Energy Board is not perfect, but it's been 50 years in the making or more. It's been vetted through the courts. We've now learned a lot. We, we know what we have to do. It's been through the courts, and now our federal government's saying, we're going to take those 50 years and all those court decisions, we're going to throw them out the window, and we're going to start from scratch with two distinct processes. That's not a good plan. Okay, uh, it, I'm going to go back to a video question. If you've got a question in the audience, please put up your hand. If you've got a question on our streaming platforms, you can pop it in comments. Premier is coming up shortly, and I know you've got a lot of questions for her too, but let's take a look at this one. So show us some love to Fred Kerr, everybody. My name is Fred Kerr. Before I started doing comedy, I was an institutional stockbroker. My job was to advise international fund managers on their investments in Alberta companies. You know that promise that Trudeau and Notley make that if we just pay enough carbon tax, we'll build all the pipelines we want. I think Albertans and investors alike expect governments to understand that what drives the economy and drives employment is private sector investment. Unfortunately, some of the things government's done for the last few years have put investors off to the point where a lot of my former clients won't touch Alberta now. <laughs> my question is, what do you plan to do to attract private sector investment back to this province? I want to thank you. My name is Fred Kerr. Thank you. That's really specific Alberta humor that he's doing there. I like it. <laughs> uh, and, and we'll put that question to the Premier uh, for sure, because I do know that the investment, and I had a number here I'm looking for right now, um, has, has dropped off even just over the past uh, year and a half. People aren't willing to invest capital because for the reasons that you're saying, they just don't know what's going to happen next. Have you seen that yourself? 
Well, we've seen it, uh, I think, in spades in Alberta in terms of reduced activity, and also uh, I think we've seen it in terms of Canadian companies starting to invest outside of Canada, making large acquisitions. And this is, again, not just oil and gas, mining. Uh, they're too frustrated dealing in Canada, which is a, a, not a, a statement I'm happy to say as a proud Canadian. But not only are we getting reduced foreign investment in Canada, Canadian companies themselves are starting to look elsewhere because it's just too frustrating. Exactly. Yeah, and I mean, there's real evidence just in terms of companies' ability to raise equity or debt. Uh, last year, in 2018, we raised $1 billion for the... This is an industry that generates $100 billion in revenue, and we raised $1 billion of equity and debt. A typical year would have been like $14 billion. And so uh, investors are voting. I do think getting market access for our gas and oil is a critical step to bring investment dollars back here um, because as it stands now, money doesn't, you know, investors don't have to invest in Canada, they can invest anywhere. And with these differentials and with market access issues, it's a lot of uncertainty. Why would you put your dollars here? And, and they're not. Okay, Adrian has a question in the audience. Yes, sir. Yes, hi, uh, my name is Nick, and I was wondering if the panel might discuss what kind of tools does Alberta have to pressure the federal government to actually do something about pipelines? I don't think really they want to do anything about it. They just seem to have completely abdicated their federal responsibility. Um, you know, I mean, they already have rights of way, um, and really this is a federal jurisdiction that they do not wish to exercise. Mm -hmm. That, that echoes uh, something that Jason Kenney told me last night, just so you don't think I was ignoring him. I met with him yesterday, and that interview will be on uh, The National tonight. So it, it echoes some of the concerns that he has as well, and again, something to put to the Premier. Hunter, maybe you can talk a little bit, though, about what, what you're seeing out there in terms of a call to, to do something, you know, yeah. because there, there are, you know, big indigenous communities who do support the oil and gas sector, who do want the pipeline. Do they feel like uh, this government, the provincial government's not doing enough or the federal government's not doing enough? Well, I think that's a really great question. I think it's important to be asking what can be done. I think what's really important to not lose sight of is the fact that what we're seeing is the very unique relationship that indigenous peoples have with the government. Um, we have our treaty rights, which are um, enshrined within the Constitution. So what we're seeing is not only the federal government, but the judicial system um, ensuring that those rights are protected. Yeah, and, and so the federal government right now is going around and consulting on the expansion uh, of the pipeline because, as you know, the federal court said you didn't do a good enough job the first time around. So that process has started. Um, I don't know what else you could do to try and speed that up. I, I guess Jason Kenney in this interview says, well, you could have appealed the federal court decision. Um, I don't know, Sachi, do you want to weigh in there? Well, there are the legal and the governmental and the legislative mechanisms, and then there is people power. This, this is a double election year in Alberta, and uh, I think the one thing, again, we're seeing, regardless of, of who's in power, is a sense that Ottawa isn't listening. Uh, we see this theme over and over and over again. And by the way, this is the one thing you have in common with the other four Western provinces. So you may feel like you don't have a lot in common, <laughs> but you do. And it's the sense of being on the outside looking in. And so, you know, we saw the movie before three decades ago yeah. with the rise of the Reform Party coming out of nowhere, feeling like it came out of nowhere. Yes, but yes. of course, it was a very long simmering sense of resentment. You know, will this be the year where we start to see similar flashpoints where people in this part of the country just say, you know what, we've heard from all you three main parties before and we're looking for a different something lever else. to pull yeah, yeah. and we've had enough and we're going to do something about that. Indeed, we put out numbers today uh, from the Angus Reid Institute that indicates a third of people in Western Canada and 40% of Albertans say that they would vote for a Western Canadian party. Of course, there isn't one that exists today, <laughs> but <laughs> if it did, it would, it would be certainly one that is pulling from all three federal parties. So you have, as voters, the power to really put the heat not just to the government in power today, the governments in power, but really to the opposition and say, what are you going to do yeah. differently? Yeah. Aside from saying, well, those people aren't doing it right. Yeah, and I mean, a critical year for you because you've got your provincial election and a federal election. There's a, there's a lovely man up here who's had his hand up for way too long. <laughs> but So we'll get someone to you, but I'm going to take one more audience question, then we're going to get the Premier out because I know you'd like to hear from her. Go ahead. Thanks. My name is William. I want Hi, to William. follow up on that question on investor confidence. Yeah. 
And why is it that we keep hearing that things are down, but all we hear from the government is that things are up? Do we hear that? Well, I think it uh, depends what part of the country you're talking about. And uh, fortunately, there are parts of this country uh, that are doing well. And of course, as a Canadian, I want to see all parts of this country do well. Uh, but unfortunately, today, Alberta is not one of them. And in terms of the investor confidence, uh, you know, it goes back again to the regulatory process. How can you ask investors to invest when nobody knows what the rules are, the time frames are, the decision process? What people don't want to see is what happened on Northern Gateway with Enbridge. We spent five or six years in a regulatory process. The project was approved. Enbridge spent, I don't know exactly how much, over a half a billion dollars. Yeah, it was over a half a billion. Over a half a billion dollars getting that approval. And then the government said, you know what, we're not going to do that. No company is going to undertake that and no investor is going to back that. We need a clear, defined, workable, reliable regulatory process. But doesn't the federal, and I'm going to, I'll end it here and, and bring in the premier, doesn't the federal government have a role to play and, uh, in making decisions based on what is in the national interest, right? Absolutely. What is the What is the safest pipeline? What is the one that makes the most right. sense for the country? Uh, like, are you, are you suggesting that they shouldn't be making those decisions or that the process leading up to them should be different? So I think the process leading up to, be, uh, leading up to it should be different. Uh, these investors need some fast feedback. And again, let's use Northern Gateway. If that's really the case, that the federal government feels that a pipeline should not be built there, then the whole regulatory process should not have been undertaken. But to have a company undertake it for the, that many years, a half a billion dollars later, and then just say, you know what? We don't think a pipeline should go there. That, that doesn't benefit anybody. It doesn't benefit Canadians to have our own companies uh, to be cut off at the knees like that, to waste that much time and money of our resources. Okay, I'm gonna send these guys away briefly, if that's okay. Thank you all very much. They're gonna come back. Uh, Chris Hunter, Dennis and Chachi. And uh, we will bring out the Premier of Alberta. Most of the questions uh, have been online, have been for the Premier. I feel like most of your questions are for the Premier. Uh, so we will get to some of those as soon as she gets out here. Are you enjoying yourselves? Okay, good. Good. <laughs> Are you feeling some love? That's part of why I'm here, too. Okay, so I'm going to move over a little bit, and the Premier's going to come into the middle, and we will uh, get going. Premier Rachel Notley. She is. Here she is. Say hello to the Premier. Your Premier, everybody. Good to see you, Premier. Hello. Hello. Good to see you. Good to see Thank you. Thank you for making the time. Please have a seat. I'm going to tease. I'm going to tease her first because she walked to work this morning and looked <laughs> totally frozen. It was fresh and the sun came out. So you know that's the thing about about Alberta winters. Brave, brave sky. Okay, uh, thank you for being here. Lots of people have questions. I'm sure you were listening to some of them. Lots of questions online for you as well. We are trying to understand some of the frustration in the province. Canadians are trying to understand. So let me get right to it. Barb Peary is asking on Facebook, what does the Premier say or think about the derailment that happened uh, just yesterday in, in BC, in Nearfield, BC? Three people died in that derailment. Um, it wasn't shipping oil, fortunately, but you are looking to buy rail cars. You mm -hmm. want to ship more uh, by rail because you don't have a pipeline. So what do, you, what do you think of the fact that that accident happened at all? Well, I mean, let, let me start, of course, by offering uh, my and, and on behalf of the people of Alberta the condolences uh, to the families of, of the uh, workers uh, that uh, died in that crash. I mean, it's a tragedy. And, and quite frankly, everything that we can do to promote uh, safety in the workplace uh, is something that we should do. Uh, that's not red tape, that's um, good management, and that's uh, the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so it's, it was uh, very tragic that that happened. And uh, and um, so I, I certainly hope that uh, we're able to see a, a quick investigation and a quick set of recommendations on how uh, we can change the way things are done so that folks that are doing that important work are kept, kept safe in their workplace and get home to their families. Does it, does yeah. it give you pause, though, when you are looking for uh, leasing thousands of rail cars? Does it give you pause? 
Well, you know, I think we all know, quite frankly, that pipelines are the safest way uh, to move uh, products uh, or oil and gas products um, through Canada. We all know that. That's why uh, we've been fighting uh, since day one of our government, certainly, uh, to get more pipelines built and in particular to get a pipeline to Tidewater. Um, we all know that many goods are shipped each and every day uh, on rail throughout uh, throughout the country, um, but quite frankly, what all Albertans want is for our products to be shipped uh, by pipelines. But, quite, but the other problem is, is that we've come to a point where after you know, decades of, of uh, failures on the part of successive federal governments, we haven't got the pipelines built. We're in a position now in Alberta where we've had to take the unprecedented step of pulling back on production in order to bring back the price that, that we get in Alberta, to bring it back up. Uh, for this product, and that is an unsustainable situation. It's a non-economic situation. It has consequences. People are hurt by that decision too, and and it's a function of uh, our country not working the way it should when it comes to the simple act of moving important products from one place to another so that people who want to buy them can, and also so that the country as a whole can grow economically because, um, well, I'm sure we'll get back into it, but I have to say at the very outset, you know, we've been hearing a lot, you've been hearing a lot in the last couple of days, and of course we in, in Alberta have been hearing about it for years, about Albertans and Alberta families who are struggling as a result of the drop in the price of oil and what's been happening to our energy industry. And we can talk a lot about the folks on the front lines as well as the people who were working in downtown Cal Calgary and everything in between. But I also need to say that it's not just them. It's also the um, aspiring fine arts student who lives in downtown Toronto. It is also the school principal who lives in St. John's, Newfoundland. It's the small business owner who lives on Vancouver Island. The fact of the matter is this, the incredible quality of life that each and every Canadian enjoys in this country is in large part due to Canada's energy industry, our resource industry, and in particular, the oil and gas industry here in Alberta. And, and so when we're unable to, to do that thing in a way that is economically uh, str and strategically smart, then everybody suffers. Like, so you're, we're talking to Albertans here, but it actually has consequences across yeah. this country. I mean, if it was a simple thing, though, mm -hmm. you have the pipeline already, so it's not a simple thing. But mm -hmm. I, I want to talk about the people. Lola Strand uh, mm -hmm. is in the audience and has a question, but we have some of her backstory first. So here's Lola. Sure. My name is Lola Strand. I was born and raised in Drayton Valley, as were my parents. Uh, so I have really strong roots here. The last 13 years, I've been employed with Drayton Valley and District Family Community Support Services. What we have noticed over the last specifically couple of years is that the folks that are coming in looking for resources are those people who never imagined that they would ever be in the position to be looking for supports that way. They are the folks that are losing their jobs due to the downturn in the economy. So despite the fact that many of these people have planned for the boom and bust cycles that we do go through in our community, it's just going on too long this time. Their savings are depleted, they're starting to use credit, and that's starting to run out as well. Unfortunately, lots of people are saying right now that they may have no choice but actually move away from this community and possibly move away from Alberta, which is really sad because many of these people, this is their home and, and they've, they've been here all their life. And Lola's in the audience. Thank you for coming, Lola. And you have a question for the Premier. Yes, <coughs> Premier, not me. Only my question for you is, what can you do to ensure that people can remain in their communities in Drayton Valley and in Alberta and not have to leave the communities that they've been um, in for most of their lives. Well, thank you, Lola, for, for that question. And also thank you for, you know, telling folks a little bit about your experience uh, because it's, it's really important. And I know that uh, folks across the province 
are really struggling um, as a result of the, of the you know, unprecedented drop in the price of oil and the fact that we're struggling now with getting our product to a place that it can be purchased. Um, and so uh, you've put a really good point on it. So there's a, there's a lot of things. Obviously the first thing that, and I think everyone agrees, is we have to get this pipeline built uh, in order to, uh, to, to bring back the opportunity to get a better price for the product and to bring more investment back to Alberta uh, and, and to put folks back to work there. Uh, but in, in the shorter term, uh, our government has been working uh, since we've been elected uh, to find ways to support families and, and workers who live in these communities. Uh, at, at the outset, when, we, when, we, when this all happened, uh, we made a decision that we were going to continue as a government to, to fund those other elements of, of, uh, of um, government programs that people rely on and perhaps more given what's been going on. So, uh, you know, whether it be uh, healthcare, education, social support, housing, those kinds of things, uh, we did that. We also invested in a lot more infrastructure in order to find, to help people uh, get different kinds of work, often not as good paying work, but at least some kind of work. So we actually uh, accelerated quite significantly our infrastructure investments in Alberta uh, as sort of a counter-cyclical thing. We have a number of economic diversification programs specifically geared uh, to smaller communities. The CARES program, we have about 200 programs that we have funded uh, since we introduced that to uh, support uh, small business and entrepreneurial uh, folks in these communities. Um, so those are some of the things that we are doing. Uh, you know, we, we don't definitely want people to leave these communities. We don't want them to leave Alberta. In fact, people are still coming to Alberta right now, even as all this is happening. But I know that uh, in places like Drayton Valley and other uh, communities that rely so much on our oil and gas sector, uh, we have to, to work with those municipal leaders, with those community leaders to find ways uh, to support them and other diversification efforts. And, and it's slow going. We've had some starting successes, but we know there's more to do. Okay, Lola, I'm not sure that was exactly the answer you wanted, but it's a start. Mm -hmm. uh, Carl Hawk on Facebook asks, what is the Alberta, and we, asked, we got this in the audience before you came out, what is the government uh, game plan to move the federal government towards completion of a major pipeline project? When will this be implemented? Mm -hmm. Your uh, opposition <laughs> leader, Jason Kenney, said the same thing to me yesterday. Why are you not doing more? What more could you do to get Ottawa moving faster? Right. Well, I mean, we have been pushing Ottawa since day one, and uh, I actually think it is, uh, to, to some degree, uh, as a result of the work that we have done, that they ultimately bought the pipeline when the uncertainty that was created over this regulatory morass that we have in this country uh, uh, almost pushed private sector investors out. The federal government at least came in and bought the pipeline and kept it alive. Um, and uh, we pushed very, very hard to make that happen. Uh, you know, in the meantime, um, we are, you know, I think there was some conversation about it earlier today. Uh, you know, there's different ways you can sort of, you can meet with federal politicians, you can publicly call them out, you can stand in a room and yell at them. The other way to deal with politicians is to make the people that they are accountable tell them what to, to tell them what to do. So I'm one voter in Alberta, but there are Canadians across this country to whom the federal government is accountable. And so our government very early on made the decision that we had to raise the, the level of discussion about the importance of our energy industry and the importance of, of pipeline construction, uh, not just in Alberta where everyone knew the issue, but across the country where they're in vote-rich provinces like Ontario and, and, uh, and even Quebec, uh, although we have still work to do there, and Atlantic Canada and everywhere else in between. And so, you know, our numbers, because frankly we poll too, uh, show that we've been able to move the dial from just a little over uh, 4 in 10 Canadians who are in support of pipelines to just under 7. In 10 Canadians and and so the more we push that the more we know that our federal government has to take this seriously so that's part of what okay. we've been doing and that's that's you as a voter but you are also a politician so well, that's uh, what I'm doing as a premier <laughs> yeah. but Debbie Golden though mm -hmm. asked this question mm -hmm. and she wants a yes or no we'll mm -hmm. see um, I like how Debbie Golden thinks though mm -hmm. would you withhold transfer payments until the pipeline happens well I, I think one of the things we have to do is make sure that, that we are all 
that, that we're all uh, fully aware of uh, the way these things work. I mean, transfer payments are not a payment that we write, the ch that the government of Alberta writes the check. Uh, transfer payments are, are what happens when uh, across the, the, the country, the people and the corporations that make the most pay the most tax. Uh, and 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 so that's that's how it works. You, you, um, you can't withhold them. So, Is that what you're it's, saying? so it's people yeah. are the ones who are paying yeah. their taxes. But it, she highlights a very important point, which I want to take this opportunity, presumably uh, to a national audience, to highlight, which is this, that, that you know, there are four provinces in the country where collectively the people and the businesses through their corporate taxes or their income tax uh, pay more to the federal government than they receive back. Uh, one of those provinces is, um, is uh, uh, Saskatchewan, and roughly on a per capita basis, they pay about $330 a year more than they, to the federal government than they get back. Uh, the other two provinces, uh, or two of the others, are BC and Ontario. And roughly, each of them pays about $1,200 a month on a per capita basis more to Ottawa than they get back. In Alberta, that number is about $5,300 per capita, more to Ottawa than we get back. So what that says to me is that all Canadians rely on Alberta to do well. There is not a school, there is not a hospital, there is not a road, there's not a port, my friends, in any part of this country that doesn't owe part of its existence to the people of Alberta and the prosperity that is driven by our energy industry. But you're not saying that and that's Alberta the case even now. Yeah. But, but you, you, I mean, you understand why that transfer equalization mm -hmm. system exists, is mm -hmm. to balance out wealth across the country. So you're not saying, or are you, that Albertans don't want that burden or that weight. They I am not. They no, don't want to do that anymore. We don't have the ability to change that anyway. But what, what it? But the reason I am saying it is that the rest of Canada needs to understand how much we need to do well. And 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 frankly, I think more and more they are. As I say, you know, there's other examples too. You know, how, you, you know, uh, Toronto relies very much on a on a strong financial uh, services industry, and the Toronto Stock Exchange is, you know, obviously operates out of Toronto. Well, a significant portion of the work that goes on in the Toronto Stock Exchange is driven by Alberta or Alberta's energy economy. Capital investment, huge amount of capital capital investment in Canada comes as a result of the energy industry. So if we don't figure out how to capitalize on this resource that we have, which is we are the second biggest uh, uh, country in the world for this resource, but we operate like we're the 20th biggest because we can't get it together. And all Canadians, I think, should know why we need to get it together. Okay, we have an audience question here. I'm going to get you a glass of water. So let's <laughs> go ahead and I'll just pour that. Bit, yeah. I'll just do yeah. that. <laughs> go ahead. Good evening, Premier. Mm -hmm. My name is Alex, and I have a quick question about Bill 12. So when it was announced, it was indicated that this could be used as a measure to restrict oil sales to British Columbia. I'm curious if you could provide an example of a circumstance that would prompt Alberta to make that restriction and mm -hmm. what outcome you would hope mm -hmm. to achieve by doing so. That's a good question. That's a good Thank one. Thank you. Yeah. Well, Bill 12 was something that we introduced um, uh, back when uh, the BC government was uh, sort of positioning itself as the primary impediment to moving uh, TMX forward. And so we gave ourselves uh, the authority to move around our resources in a way that was strategic and got us the best price possible. As things stand now, the, the barrier to uh, getting TMX built no longer rests with the government of BC. Quite frankly, when uh, the government of Canada bought that pipeline, the efforts that the government of BC was doing to um, harass private sector investments, investors out of the pipeline business became null and void because now the federal government uh, owns that pipeline. So now the issue is about doing the work that was laid out in the Federal Court of Appeal decision in August of 2018, the, uh, the reconsideration around ma marine safety, the appropriate consultation and accommodation of Indigenous concerns, and then moving forward to get the pipeline built. And so uh, if we found ourselves in a situation where any jurisdiction 
around us was engaging in, uh, at one point, we, we believe the, the BC government was engaging in practically illegal activity and threatening illegal activity. If they started doing that again, well then we would have to, to look at uh, the, the, w the degree to which we could uh, use that dial as a, as a means of influencing future behavior. Okay, another question in the audience. It's the uh, Mayor of Sturgeon County. Good to see you, Mayor. What's your question for the Premier? Good evening, Ms. Barton and uh, Premier Notley. I'm, I'm just going to have a, a brief preamble. 12% uh, of Canada's rural population lives in Alberta, and Alberta is experiencing 21% of the nation's rural crime. Suicides are on the rise, alarmingly by 30% in 2015, and we're experiencing an increase in domestic violence and assaults as Albertans struggle with unemployment and economic hardship. Sturgeon County, along with the rest of Alberta, is dealing with 84,000 private sector jobs that have been lost since Q4 of 2014. And the government of Alberta revenues have declined from approximately $9 billion in 2014 to $3 billion in 2017. This has lost money that is needed to provide roads, hospitals, doctors, nurses, school teachers, police services, social programs, and research and development for green energy alternatives. The province's regulatory competitiveness is our only significant opportunity to alleviate the economic and social deterioration of Alberta, which will ultimately affect the rest of Canada's economy. The regulatory framework process is inefficient, lengthy, and complex which generates investor uncertainty. Premier Notley, are you willing to standardize and accelerate regulatory frameworks by setting binding targets and benchmarks that are comparable to other jurisdictions to ensure resources are produced with environmental and social responsibility before Canada's market share is replaced by other countries with little or no environmental or labor standards? And that's a Mayor Alana Natchu, yeah. right? That's your yes, yeah. Alana Natchu, Sturgeon County. Yes, right. thank you very much, yeah. Mayor. Okay, Premier, go ahead. That's a, a lengthy question, okay. but it, it, it was. Uh, I'm, I'm, and I'm, I, I hope I'm understanding the the question there. But uh, I mean, there's, so so there's a number of things that uh, that that were touched on there. I, I know, for instance, that a lot of folks in rural Alberta, uh, partially I think as a result of what's been going on with with uh, the economy, and partially just as, as a result of uh, the way crime changes at times, but have been dealing with some very serious uh, concerns around property crime. And our government was uh, pleased to be able to introduce a rural crime strategy uh, last year, and we've seen significant reductions uh, in many measures of, of rural crime since that. So we're pleased to have been able to actually have taken action and seen the outcome. Uh, in, in terms of uh, regulatory, uh, um, the, the regulatory regime, uh, you know, we, there's a few things that are going. First of all, our Ministry of Energy is working with the AAR to look at ways in which we can uh, speed up some of the uh, regulatory um, processes that are uh, in play here in Alberta. Within um, our jurisdiction. Within our yeah, jurisdiction, yeah. absolutely. And, uh, and so we are working on that. And, uh, but I, I also think that to some degree there's a little bit of um, uh, overstatement in some quarters about uh, the degree to which that's actually the issue. Um, but you know where are we where we're able to work with industry and they're able to give us good examples of where things can be streamlined and sped up uh, without in any way compromising the the safety and the integrity the environmental integrity that's being uh, monitored then our minister is working very carefully with them going forward uh, I will say this that Alberta is a very, very progressive and um, sophisticated economy. And it is one that is built on uh, a population that is not only the youngest, but the best educated uh, in the country. And our economic future is one that should be built on maintaining and growing that progressive, uh, uh, diversified uh, sophistication. We should not have an economic plan that is premised on uh, accelerating a race to the bottom with a bunch of unnamed jurisdictions who may or may not be in this country or even on this continent. Because quite frankly, uh, we will never win that race. What do you mean by that? What, what are you uh, by, talking about? by suggesting that, that uh, workers should be paid a lot less, that we should get rid of health and safety regulations, that we should uh, stop being concerned about the environment. That is not 
Albertans. We are a source of innovation. We are a source of diversification. We are a well-trained, skilled workforce. And, and each and every one of us uh, need to have those skills leveraged to continue to grow and diversify the economy, not try to pretend that we can actually compete with uh, you know, places like Mexico. So not at any cost. You're not willing to mm -hmm. have mm -hmm. these things happen quickly at any cost. That's mm -hmm. basically what you're saying. Right. Yeah. It's a race to the bottom is not an economic model. A race backwards is not an economic model. Uh, a, a plan to uh, go to where the puck is going to be, uh, given that we have the, the intellectual resources uh, to, to do that, that's how we grow our economy. Okay, Lisa Stoddard on Facebook asks, how many more jobs should the oil and gas sector expect to lose until Alberta becomes stable again? Is that something you can project for? Do you have an idea of what people should expect? Uh, you know, it's, it, 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 it's hard to uh, project because of course right now we're dealing with curtailment and that was not a thing that we thought we were going to have to deal with quite so soon. And we know that that is not great, although we've seen good results, in, uh, at least in terms of the price in the first uh, month and a half. But one of the other things that uh, we've been focused on, I haven't had a chance to talk about, uh, as we talk about the energy industry and people in the oil and gas sector, is that something we've talked about in Alberta for decades. I remember people talking about it around the kitchen table that I grew up around up in northern Alberta, which is, why aren't we getting more value for the res these amazing resources that we own. The price differential. Well, not just that, but, but can't we do more with it? Right. Why can't we do more with it? And not since Peter Lougheed has that conversation really been had in a serious way. So in the, in the last uh, year and a half, our government has embarked upon the most ambitious energy diversification program and value-add upgrading program since Peter Lougheed. We call it the Made in Alberta program. We've dedicated roughly $3.2 billion to a whole array of programs to incent strategic investment in upgrading. So, for example, just in the area of petrochemical diversification here, uh, just in the industrial heartland, within the last six months, we have seen uh, two major projects that amount to about $7 billion of new investment. Collectively, they will create uh, over 5,000 jobs where we are upgrading our petrochemicals into a form of plastic. That pro those two projects alone wouldn't have happened without our Made in Alberta program. So we want to do more of that. We have more. We just announced a couple of weeks ago a partial upgrading program uh, that's also going to create thousands of jobs and it's going to actually allow us to ship uh, more oil, more bitumen, with less diluent thereby uh, opening up more space in the pipelines and reducing the emissions with which that is uh, produced. Great technology. And so it's a very exciting investment. This is something that we should have been doing 20 years ago, and we didn't. Now we are, and there are jobs being created in other parts of the energy sector as we do a better job of keeping that value here in Alberta for Albertans and in Canada for Canadians. Okay, another video question. Welcome to Oilfield Dads. I'm so glad you made it. My name is Chad Miller and I'm a founder of a social media networking group called Oilfield Dads. I built this group for those in need of support to find jobs, share stories and overcome hardships in way of solidarity for the oil and gas industry. Thanks and have a great day. My question for you, Premier Notley, is how are you going to convince Alberta and the rest of Canada that your government will cater no more to the false promises from the federal government and finally, stand up and fight for those regular hardworking Albertans. So I have to say, this is online uh, an overwhelming sentiment. Mm -hmm. This question has come up a number of times. Zaheen Sarabi says the same. Do you feel you made a mistake to trust the Prime Minister? You say you will stand up for Alberta, but not once have you done it. Well, <laughs> I guess I, I, I'm going to take a little bit of an issue with that because I think that we have been standing up for Alberta uh, since day one. We have been pushing for this pipeline since day one. Uh, I, like all Albertans, like everybody in this room, I'm sure, are very frustrated, and very frustrated, with the decision that we got in August, which delayed uh, what otherwise was a pipeline under construction for the first time in almost 70 years in the country of Canada. So, uh, but that is the federal courts, and that is not a thing uh, that I can uh, fight against. 
uh, when it comes to pushing the federal government, it, there is no question that Canada works best when we all work together. And I've already talked a little bit about some of the ways in which we've been pushing the federal government, creating a, a much uh, better level of awareness from coast to coast to coast about why this is important. Talking to groups in other parts of the country that historically didn't support pipelines. Like, so not just going into to roomfuls of, 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 of uh, high-level uh, investment financers in, in Eastern Canada, but going and talking to rooms full of environmentalists as well to talk about it. And through them, pushing the federal government, which, as I said, uh, resulted in them buying the well, pipeline. But uh, what I will also say is there's more work to be done. We are continuing to tell the federal government, for instance, that C69, and I know you guys talked about it earlier today, in its current form is not acceptable. We cannot accept that. That is going to take uh, a level of delay that we've already become used to and make it worse, and it's not acceptable. And we've told the federal government that repeatedly, and we're in negotiations now about how we can uh, get it done better. And, and so we're going to continue to do that. Um, but we are all part of this country. We will continue to fight, but we're going to continue to fight as people who uh, need to uh, know, know the path to getting the folks you're trying to convince to get there with you. And, uh, and that's what we're, I'm going to continue to work on doing. Okay, another audience question. Hello, sir. Hi, um, I'm Corey. Hi, Corey. Uh, my question is, like, we've heard tonight there's... Uh, your money lost up in Ottawa, um, things like that, your fight with the Supreme Court. But really, like, we got these protesters over on the uh, West Coast who are being paid off by the Americans to do this. And I almost wonder how much of this money is going towards policymakers, politicians, also here in Canada, uh, the Supreme Court possibly, to work against our pipelines. And when do we actually drop the gloves and fight these people properly on their level to actually win? We're supposed to leave this better for our kids. Okay, uh, what was your name again, sorry? Corey. Corey, I will say, Corey, I don't think the Supreme Court is being paid off. I, I, and I don't think there's evidence of that. I, I, yeah, I, 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 so I'll, I'll, I'll dispute that in terms of a fact check, but the mm -hmm. Premier, uh, maybe just speak to the broader issue of, I think there, it, it is true that there are people protesting the pipeline in other places mm -hmm. in the country. Mm -hmm. Again, I don't think they are being paid. I think there are people who have legitimate concerns. So what would you say to people in British Columbia who are going to have to live with this pipeline mm -hmm. and just don't want it in their backyard, mm -hmm. the same way you probably wouldn't want one in yours? Right. Well, let me start by saying, uh, you know, I, I definitely hear the frustration in Corey's voice. And I know yes. that, that uh, he's speaking for a lot of people who also share the frustration, you know, and I, I, I get frustrated when, when people say, oh, it's a zero-sum game. If you do a pipeline, then you don't care about the environment and vice versa. Sure. And so one of the things that I say and have been saying all along, that uh, we have an obligation to protect uh, our environment, our air, and our land, and our water, even, you know, the, the West Coast, for generations to come. But it is not an either-or proposition, and that you have to have economic prosperity uh, in order to do that. And, and people who suggest that you only can have one or the other, well, quite frankly, that has been the politics of division that has driven this conversation for the last two decades, and it's gotten us to where we're at now, and it ain't working. And I've made that case repeatedly in BC, and I know there have been other people talking about BC, but I, and I know, I actually heard uh, someone on CBC earlier today saying, oh, the majority of British Columbians uh, don't support this anymore. That's not actually true. No, yeah. The majority of British Columbians are with us now on this point. I think Sachi, Sachi said half and half. You're about and half and half. I, I would say there's different <laughs> polls. Uh, so she has, a, that's a conservative estimate. And what I know is that it's She's changing making and faces it's at you, But we'll bring her back up but, in a minute. But <laughs> what I will say is, is this, is that um, um, what we have been doing is we've been going out to BC and we've been talking not just to the folks on our side, but to the people uh, who might be inclined to support those, uh, those protesters to say, listen, 
folks, this is what it means to you. And, you know, talking about the numbers that yeah. I talked about, this is how much uh, Alberta gives to your But even if you economy. do that, Premier, and I'm going to get to a question from, from the mayor, there I, are some people that, that don't care. Like, that they just don't Some want don't, it. but yeah. here's the bottom line. There's a difference between a core group that will never change their mind and, and the political consensus where clearly what's happened is it's shifted. And my uh, argument is that we're going to continue to talk to folks in BC. I go to BC and I have more and more people coming to me saying, we support you on this. And, I've, and, and let me also say to Albertans, just because I haven't had a chance to say this either, a big thank you to them. Because it's not just us, it's each and every Albertan reaching across those mountains, talking to their brothers, their sisters, their in-laws, their union members from other unions, their, their business colleagues, their, uh, you know, people that are in, uh, you know, cross-provincial volunteer groups, sporting groups, whatever, making that case. And that's how we're moving the dial, and we're going to keep doing it. Okay, the mayor of Drayton Valley, uh, Mayor Michael Dirksen, nice mm. to see you. Thank you for coming. Yes, thank you. All right. uh, Premier Notley, I, I want to switch the topic a little bit to rural diversification. And I do want to say thank you for the work that you and your government is doing in uh, pushing pipelines. I now watch hockey games and I see the commercials all over the place. So, um, so us in Drayton Valley, we have a clean energy technology center, which was funded with provincial grant dollars that hasn't been formally opened. So we would love to have you out in Drayton Valley to open that if you would like to come. But uh, the work that we're doing there, we're talking about uh, industrial hemp. So uh, Drayton Valley, oil and gas community, but we're looking beyond that. We're looking at um, industrial hemp. And if you planted it, it must, as much industrial hemp as we have canola, in this country, we would meet 50% of the Paris climate change numbers because uh, it's a great carbon sequester. We have reports from MNP that the town of Drayton Valley has paid for mm -hmm. saying that through loan guarantees from the province, we're not asking for money, just for loan guarantees, uh, we could create 300 jobs within our community. So my question to you is, are, are you and your government willing to listen to municipalities and actually do proper rural di diversification from the municipal leaders that have to stand there every day and deal with our public? Uh, you know, absolutely. Like, I'm not going to speak to your specific project because uh, I have an obligation to, you know, have people look at it and, and consider the merits of the whole nice thing. Try, but have, nice try, though. Nice try. But, yeah, good on you. <laughs> uh, but although I will say that, you know, we do know that hemp has tremendous opportunities. And, and what our government has done so far is we have funded... Uh, uh, Regional um, Economic Development, RIDAs, they're called RIDA, uh, Regional Economic Development Associations, to come up to do the kind of work that creates exactly the kinds of ideas that your folks are coming up with. In addition, we funded uh, the CARES program, which is more of a grant-based program to kickstart some of these things. But we also have uh, made, uh, through ATB, uh, created a, a fund where uh, there's more um, uh, capital available for uh, economic develop uh, de development initiatives and diversification opportunities outside of energy. And so we've been doing that kind of work. But, you know, I was at a small mayor's uh, um, forum last week, and one of the things that I will say is that on a one-off basis, uh, you know, we are always willing to work with our municipal leaders and our regional leaders on ways in which uh, the areas that, that the, federal, the provincial government already offers, operates in can partner with our regional partners to help support uh, these kinds of diversification projects. We talked about, you know, in, in Lethbridge, we had the single biggest private sector investment in Lethbridge a couple of years ago as a result of partnering between our government and the municipality uh, to support some irrigation work that attracted investors. So point being is we're absolutely willing to hear what you guys have to say and we look forward to sitting down and talking to you about how we might be able to work do, together. Do, do, will you go to Drayton Valley? Because I don't think you've been and they'd yeah. love to see yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, I, either me or one of the ministers. Okay, I'm trying. Uh, yeah. I'm trying I never for make you. a commitment about my calendar, I'm sorry. I'm trying <laughs> for you. Okay, uh, one more audience question, a couple online, and then we will free the Premier. Uh, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> Good evening, Premier Notley. Um, I'm seeing that the, the um, global demand for oil is increasing steadily every year, and my concern is, is that the curtailment is a temporary mm -hmm. measure. I think it's until December. And I'd like to know, what are we going to do if Bill C-69, 
were to pass in the Senate, mm -hmm. how would we get pipelines built? Because Trans Mountain seems to be in legal, it's gonna be in the courts maybe for, we don't know how many years. Mm -hmm. So what would be your plan to get pipelines built? Because we're gonna get railway cars, but is there track time? Is BC gonna allow increased train traffic through their province? Mm -hmm. So how would we get our oil to global market? We have 30 countries worldwide that are wanting to buy Canada's ethical and responsible oil. Uh, I lots agree. Of stuff there. Yeah, lots of stuff yeah. there and, and some really good points. And those are exactly the kinds of things that uh, we work through all the time. So we have, you know, it's what we've referred to in the past as sort of, you know, short term, medium term and two long term strategies to deal with the issue that you raised there. So you're right, curtailment is scheduled to end in December as you probably would have heard. Last week we made a, a significant announcement uh, where we were able to reduce the amount of production that we are curtailing or put another way to allow more production to take place. Uh, so that was good news uh, because we've been able to accelerate that. And, and you know, we're, we're hopeful that we'll continue to see the same kinds of results that we already have. Um, Rail is something that is, is an interim measure, and that's why we are in the process of uh, negotiating a deal with rail. Don't worry about BC. They don't get to say yay or nay to what goes on to their tracks. Um, and so we are in the midst of negotiating enough rail to deal with the period of time uh, during which there's a, a, a gap between how much we have to produce and how much we need to take There is away. a shortage of rail cars, though, to leave. Well, we, we well, that's know That's the problem that, you're running we're, into there, yeah. We know, but we're, yeah. we're finding them. We're, we're very close to having a deal and having this, this one figured out, okay. and we'll be able to, to uh, talk to Albertans about that very soon. Okay. Um, but then, of course, we have to deal with pipelines, and we have Line 3 uh, expected to come on uh, around... Um, uh, right around uh, January of 2020. And, uh, but then because of the increased production, which you rightly identified, come about mid-2020, we're gonna find ourselves potentially in a gap again. And that's why the rail is a good investment because we're gonna need it off and on for the next two or three years while we're waiting for TMX to get through this process. I don't think it's gonna be in the courts for years. I do think we're gonna get the approval back in play. I think we're gonna get shovels in the ground later this year. Uh, we have uh, the end of February this month, we have a big uh, um, uh, benchmark that we all need to see what happens. And if it goes our way, I think we're back on track. It's been delayed, but I think it's gonna be. Benchmark meaning what, in terms of the consultation? No, the uh, NEB decision. Oh, the NEB decision, okay. Yeah. Um, a, a, there are other questions, on, thank you for your question. A couple, two other questions online. Lots of people asking this one. Why do you still support the carbon tax? You have pulled out of the federal plan mm -hmm. to increase it over time, so you've just stayed the where you are, which I think is 30 bucks a ton, mm -hmm. is that where you're at? Yep. Why do you still support it at all, people want to know? Well, because the bottom line is, is this. Uh, we are an energy leader in Alberta, and uh, we have been for a long time, and I think we're going to be for a long time going forward. Uh, but we are not going to retain that position if we try to pretend that climate change is not an issue. What we need to do is be the most progressive, most sustainable energy producer in the world and, uh, our, um, our, and at the same time take action to build our, our technological ability to take uh, emissions out of the barrel and also otherwise diversify our energy uh, market here in Alberta, what we produce in order to reduce greenhouse gases. So what's the gases. advantage the carbon tax gives you then? Oh, well, it gives us the resources to do that and it also is, according to the Nobel uh, Prize, givers the best economic model to get the job done. So uh, we are, again, we're not going to succeed if we build an economy based lo on looking back 20 years. We are going to succeed if, if we figure out where the puck is going and get there before then. And that's what uh, understanding and uh, getting hold of the challenge of climate change means for our economy. We are an energy economy operating in a world that is worried about climate change. We need to be ahead of the curve, not running to, to hide our heads in the sand behind it or under it. And so that's what our climate leadership plan is about. Okay, there's one last question that everyone in the audience, I'm sure has, everyone on social media has. People wanna know when you're gonna call the election. <laughs> Jason Kenney wanted you to do it on the weekend. You didn't make him happy. Where, where, are, are you? Like, should, we, should we think sort of like Easter? Would that be like a convenient time? Uh, yeah. Okay, so it will be on a day. Uh, it won't be dark out. 
Um, so, and it will, uh, unlike sort of uh, previous uh, governments that were not the NDP, it will actually follow the law, uh, which is sometime between March 1st and May 30th. Yeah. You never ask that question of politicians because they never answer it. <laughs> Listen, uh, I, it's, this, these are not easy things for politicians to do because they don't know what's coming at them. So we appreciate your time. Thank you very much. And uh, I hope everybody else appreciated uh, the Premier making herself available for this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good to see you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Good to see you. <laughs> All right. We'll get the panel back up and we'll, uh, we'll take a few more questions. And we have something to work off of now because you've heard from the, the boss, if you will. For now, when do you think the election will be? If you were going to guess, <laughs> end of March, maybe? No, April? No. no. Um, <laughs> okay, um, Sachi, why don't you go ahead because you were rolling your eyes like I wasn't politely, rolling my politely eyes. at the premier. I was doing a bit of blue steel, just a little like. Aww. So let's so let's let's sort of a reality check that from your perspective, right. because it does seem to me that the premier is saying uh, one of the best ways now to get this going, to get the pipeline happening, to get Canadians to understand, is to explain, explain, explain. You know, this is where the money is coming from. You all get it too, and to sort of begin to put pressure on people. Is that working in, in across the country and particularly maybe where it matters most in British Columbia? So, yes, and we talked about this a little bit earlier on the panel that part of this PR campaign is moving the needle. Um, when Premier Notley talks about the majority in British Columbia, look, there, there is the statistical majority and then there is, you know, the, the, the political or the practical majority. I can't speak to the polling that her government is doing. I can speak <laughs> to the polling that, that, I, that we do, that our team does uh, at the Angus Reid Institute. And we, by the way, publish our questionnaires and all our data online. So you can go and it, it's very transparent. You can see what we're asking. I'm not sure what they're asking, but what I will say is this. We don't get to see their internal polling. Yeah. Well, may maybe, maybe they release it. <laughs> <laughs> um, that would be the transparent thing to do. What we have seen is an uptick in support in British Columbia to a place where we're now sitting at sort of 53% uh, supporting, about 47% still opposed. So yes, technically that is your majority, but let's talk about the intensity of the opposition and where it is. It is in vote-rich Metro Vancouver. This is where any government that needs to get elected in British Columbia needs to win votes, and this is where people are most inclined to say, hell no. Now, what are they saying no to? This is really important. We talk about explaining different points of view. I spent a lot of time in Calgary and, and time in Edmonton, and seriously, when I'm at dinner with friends out here, I am, I am ducking buns. They get thrown at me <laughs> as a Vancouverite, but, but let me try and explain this. For British Columbians who are opposed, for most of them, this is not a pipeline issue. The pipeline already exists. We're yes. talking about twinning Expansion. an existing yeah. pipeline. This is a tanker issue. There is a great deal of concern, particularly, again, Metro Vancouver. You've all seen the coastline, the beach. It's very pretty. Uh, they're worried about a sevenfold increase in tanker traffic. And so what I have said, and we've talked about this on that issue yeah. before, is it has been incumbent on the federal government and, I guess, on the government of Alberta to make the case to British Columbians that uh, the tankers are secure, that there is best-in-class prevention and spill response, and bad things aren't necessarily going to happen to your coastline. Now, that's, that feels like a big risk to British Columbians. But when you ask the question on pipelines, the temperature comes way down. When you ask the question about risk to ocean, the temperature goes right. way up. And so this is, this is about communications. Yeah. This is about making that case and those explanations. Yeah, and that's why, as the Premier said, that National Energy Board decision around that at the end of the month will be so important and, and maybe helping or hurting how that plays out. I just want to quickly sort of get your perspectives on what you heard from the Premier there, and then we'll dive back into the audience. Hunter, what, was there anything that struck you or you shook your head and disagreed with or strongly <laughs> agreed with? Or? Uh, no, I think um, one thing that's really important to understand as well um, to what was talked about is when we're talking about Indigenous nations having a say in what goes forward, what doesn't go forward, we have to understand that Indigenous peoples aren't, like you said, which was a great word, a monolith. Mm -hmm. 
um, in terms of our perspectives on energy and resource development. There are 634 First Nations, not including Métis and Inuit, not including non-status, so we have to make room for those perspectives and actually engage in a dialogue where we are willing to listen, to understand the concerns, and really take the opportunity to be like, okay, our concerns as Albertans, as Canadians, are actually not that far off. We come from different places and we have a unique relationship to each other, but we need to create that opportunity to have true dialogue. And, and to accommodate if necessary, right? Exactly. What, what did you think of what she said? Anything you know, stood out there for you? Uh, I agreed with a lot of what she said. I, I think one point she made that's really important is she said economic prosperity uh, is a prerequisite for caring about the environment. If you look at some of the poorest places in the world, they don't care much about the environment. So if we want to solve these big environmental challenges that we have, we need to have an economy. Um, so I think that's an important point we all need to remember. Also, she talked about the diversification of the economy. Lots of exciting things going on in Alberta, whether it be through the petrochemicals or some of the other industries that are growing. Um, so that's part of the exciting things that are happening. The, the, the problem with those things, though, sometimes is there is a lag, right? As you're trying to innovate and create, those jobs don't come online as quickly as, as others. So there's, that's, I think, what becomes complicated for governments. Chris, what, what struck you about what the Premier said? Anything uh, reassuring to you there as a business owner? Uh, well, absolutely. I think she has uh, uh, spoken well for our province. Uh, I thought her most uh, eloquent quote was when she was talking about the regulatory system and she said, quote, it ain't working, unquote. <laughs> and uh, I fully agree with her. You know, if we just step back and look at our regulatory system, we've been fighting in this country for, I was going to say 10 years, the Premier said 20, for a long time. Yep. And let's just take an inventory. Where are we at? Well, we've turned one Canadian against the other. We've turned one part of the country against the other. We have not reduced greenhouse gases one bit. We've devastated the Western Canadian economy. We've actually made things worse by now shipping oil uh, through uh, tankers, which is more GHG intensive, and it's more dangerous. Pipeline is the safest form of transportation. So I have to agree with the Premier, it ain't working. So maybe it's time as a country we start plan B. There has to be a better way to address this. Okay, we've got another audience question out there. Hello. Hi, my name's Brenda. Hi, Brenda. And, um, oh, sorry. Um, I, I did appreciate the uh, Premier's comments and felt she has a good understanding of the issues, which is encouraging, considering the mess that Alberta is now in. Um, I live within less than 100 yards of the current Trans Mountain Pipeline, and I never considered it would be a detriment to the value of my house, hmm. given the safety record of pipelines. I cannot understand why there is this huge resistance to pipelines. I think you have mentioned some of the problems in the regulatory process, but I hope as a nation we have enough common sense to get a better regulatory system in place and I'd like to hear how we can do it. Thank well, you. I, I wonder if how, you res how that Sachi's comment resonated with you, that, that it's the fear is not pipelines, it's what happens at the other end, tankers. Um, I, I can uh, understand some of that, but we do not have the same furor about the tankers coming into the East Coast and about all the other big ships. It's supposed to be a small percentage of the oil um, uh, tankers compared to the amount of shipping off the coast of Vancouver and I hope that we do things with integrity and safety and I have confidence that we can and that this should not be a detriment to the environment. I think people have learned from the Valdez disaster and I support a carbon tax and environmental practices 100%. So. Okay, thanks, Brenda. Jackie, do you want to take a stab at that? Um, whether there is, I don't know, something else that could be done to reassure people? I mean, Brenda I lives right there. <laughs> She's yeah. She feels okay about it. What is the issue with people's perception well, of the it, safety when of pipelines? When it comes to pipelines, I'm not sure that safety is the issue. I mean, there is concern that there could be spills, and, um, you know, we've had examples of that on the pipelines. And so I think, you know, we're doing a lot to prevent that situation and a lot of safety and regulatory requirements are there. Of course, sometimes that does happen. And so what we have to do is prove that we can deal with those very quickly as we've seen on some of the pipeline issues. When it comes to the Marine, I do think there's a lack of information and that there is an opportunity to educate more. If you think about the tanker traffic on 
our west coast, we're going from about 1% of all large ships on the west coast with the TMX that we have today to the expanded P TMX, which is more like four, 5%. And because we're increasing the number of tankers, we're also increasing the spill response um, greatly um, and putting a bunch of other safeguards in place that actually reduce the chances of a spill further than what we have today. And so I think we need to get that information out there. It's, it's hard to find. Uh, You've got to read big, long regulatory documents to try to understand this. Um, so I think there's an opportunity. But there is also, I mean, I think the, the, there is a recognition that what was in place was not enough. And that's why the National Energy Board has now gone back to look at it again. So clearly, uh, more could be done to allay yeah. some of those. I mean, concerns. I think they went yeah. back to look at the mammal issue, yes. but when it comes to the spill response and yeah. the equipment there, they're doing a lot. They're you know, doubling the spill response equipment, increasing the stations, increasing the tugs. Like We are having a much less chance of a spill uh, with this pipeline when you think, uh, and then also a much better ability to respond if there is going to be an issue than without. Okay, we're gonna take in one more question on social media. Jeannie asks on Twitter, what efforts are being made by Alberta energy groups to develop and promote renewable energy sources? So the idea that this isn't, maybe we can't do this forever. I don't know. What else can we do? What kinds of things are we developing moving forward? Chris? Well, I think as a province, we're doing quite a bit. We're phasing out of coal. We're bringing in uh, more wind power, more renewable. We've been leaders in wind power for a long time. We have some of the best and most efficient wind facilities uh, in the country, in southern Alberta, in the Pincher Creek facilities. So I think we're doing quite a bit, and we're going to do uh, quite a bit more going forward. And uh, I don't, uh, you know, I think we're leaders in that. I think you have to be careful too that we don't repeat what happened in Ontario, where they went at it full force and then uh, realized that the economics weren't there. And uh, and of course, I would say the last election when uh, Doug Ford won. Uh, arguably, it was the uh, Liberal government lost on the issue of expensive energy because rural energy was so expensive. So I think I'm they all, lost for a lot of reasons. There's a lot of reasons. <laughs> I give you that one. I give you that one. <laughs> but but I, uh, I, w I would say that I think Alberta is approaching it very logically. Uh, with great economics, and uh, we're moving in that direction. Jackie, last word to you. Yeah, I mean, we just had these three auctions that the Alberta government put forward, 3.6 cents per kilowatt hour. Like, that is cheap energy, cheaper than um, most generation out there. So we've got a great wind resource. So we've got it all in Alberta. We've got the gas, we've got the oil, we've got wind, we've got solar, and it's great to see that we're moving forward in terms of growing our, our wind power. Okay, Chris, Jackie, Hunter, Sachi, thank you all for coming thank and you. for uh, taking all these questions and, and helping us wade through some of this. If any of you still have questions, uh, do put up your hand and we will take your question down and we honestly will try and get you an answer. Same for people who are asking questions on social media. Uh, a portion of this will be broadcast tomorrow night on The National in case you want to see yourself in action, so you can tune in for that. Thank you all very much for coming. Uh, just from a, a personal note, from the program note, uh, we are listening, we are here, uh, we want to hear more from you. Um, so send story ideas, send thoughts about how we can be doing better. We appreciate you coming out. Thanks very much. Appreciate it.